How are you doing, bud? I'm doing well. How about you, Carrie? Yes, I'm doing Perfect. good. So, you're going to chat about society today? Looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. So, how do you find living in Copenhagen? I love it. Well, and of course, it must be said I'm Danish, so why wouldn't I love it? But it's, I think, having traveled around the world for a bit, having seen London, of course, but New York and everything in between, it is the perfect size for me. Like, I love New York, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be comfortable in New York. Like too many people, and for me, people seem to be too high, strong in a certain way, that I don't I don't get the same vibe from from Danish people. And of course, I'm biased being a Dane, <laughs> of course. But there's there's something about being six million people as a country, as opposed to Los Angeles, that's a city of six seven million people. That the, the whole know thought about us being uh, an entire country and have to work things out uh, as opposed to just a city that massive and having to just you know deal with what happens in a you know municipality or whatever there's something to it which i perceive as quite nice so i, I quite enjoy it mm -hmm. yeah. and so what about you what about um uh, so growing up in london <laughs> i think uh, when i was growing up in london i used to be proud to say i was from london i think it comes with um benefits and it also comes with some negatives i think growing up in a big city you could eat you're easier to go down the wrong path and you're exposed to a lot more i think you grow up a bit quicker than some people i've met when i've done traveling around the world and different cultures if they're coming from other countryside like some of my cousins you know as exposed to the amount of things that are actually going on in everyday life so growing up i really liked it and all the opportunities that it, it has brought but um now I would think I would like to experience a different kind of city because of some of the factors you said. When you're in a large place, people are not friendly. It's it's weird. It's, if you start saying hi to someone like that, they're gonna think you're like off your rocker and you need some meds or something. So um, that's something I do like about Copenhagen, the fact that people can just talk to each other in everyday life, whereas it's not that's not really normal in London. I do think the um, work-life balance in London though is a is, is not very good. Mm. I think um, there it's a place where people work. It's, um, they, they don't really think about the, the balance of maybe people's even mental health as a part of that. So it's a bit of a rat race, I think, in London. It, it's so funny that you should mention rat race because I've, I've, it must be said, I've been to London, I think about 15, 20 times maybe, and, and stayed there for like quite a bit each time. And when I've been out with mates uh, in London and I asked them, what is your situation like? What up with friends and colleagues from work? A lot of the time I hear that they don't spend that much time together because a lot of people can't afford the housing in London. So just going to work and going you know, back again to wherever you're like stationed, it is something that takes you know between like half an hour as a minimum or maybe two hours so the whole mm. you know concept of we've been to work we've had mm. fun let's go grab a pint or whatever it's it's for some people very remote because they they can't afford to quote unquote waste that time being social because they need to get back because it's such a distance to travel and this is why it's such a vicious cycle so if you are traveling to maybe see your friends which is really important to have that time you then you might be getting home late, you're then off for work early and you go around. Then the weekend you might end up getting plastered or whatever kind of adjective you want to use and you're back into work and it's that vicious cycle going on. Um, I think that's one of the benefits about Copenhagen is that you can kind of cycle about 30 minutes anywhere to, to go and meet your friends, uh, which is which is obviously really nice. And you also, this city set up that you can actually cycle places where it would be a bit more dangerous in London. Don't want to just slate though, because I think there are some great benefits about about the capital. No, only obviously just time start there, but if you're having a good, if you want, if you want to have a good time, you can definitely have it in London. And you got everything's going on. There's a, there's a from the theater to filming to sports to any kind of night out you want. That for that factor, I think London's one of the best cities in the world. I would agree. It has an amazing uh, social life and the entertainment value of being able to just. Uh, visit the West End and seeing, you know, like seeing actual theater. And when I say actual theater, it's not because we don't have theaters in Denmark, but, you know, going to London or New York, it's on such a different scale that, that we can't compete. And maybe for obvious reasons, I don't know, but for sure, London has a lot of things. Mm. But 
it doesn't have bike lanes, so it's, it's hazardous <laughs> to, yeah. to be going on a bike in London. But I, I still feel that spending a week in London may be my max because, again, the same vibe as New York. It's it's high strong, you know. So so busy. Everyone needs to go to the you know A to B, yeah. and so on and so forth. And everything is just so stressed. I don't see it in the same way that people are relaxing on you know squares or in parks as we do in Denmark. Not to say that it won't happen in London, mm. of course. But it, having experienced Copenhagen and, and the Danish way of doing it, it's it's still quite a different you know vibe to it. Not as relaxed, I would say. I do find that I've been a, if I come back from a holiday, maybe somewhere a forum with like beaches and everything. If you're flying into Stansted, you're likely to get the train into Liverpool Street. And when you get into Liverpool Street, you know you're back in London because it is just <laughs> chaos. People just pulling in and out with each other. And I've noticed that when I when I get back in when I'm in London and used to living there, my uh, pace of walking and doing things is really fast to the point that when I'm actually away, I'll be walking down these lovely high streets and I'll be walking past people. I'll be weaving in and out of people and I'll be in a rush. And, I, and, and what am I rushing for? I'm, I'm on holiday. So it actually takes a few days to calm down, slow down a bit. And then as soon as I'm back in London, I'm then running for that bus again. <laughs> but it's a, yeah, you're better off getting off the standstill. Because if you go out in Luton and you walk through Luton town after being somewhere nice on holiday, that's when reality will really hit you hard. <laughs> but yeah, um, Denmark is known to be one of the happiest societies. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what it says in in the research stuff. Why, why do you think that is then that creates this happy this happy bubble that is that's here in Denmark? It's a good question, mate. Because I think I think some of it might have to do with like uh, in general the Scandinavian mentality. And what is the Scandinavian mentality? Um, I don't know. But <laughs> but look but but looking at like Norway, Sweden, and Denmark as as like three brothers, there are definitely things that you know. Uh, are similar going from one country to other that there is such a familiarity not just in the architecture or the uh, the design you know Danish design wooden chairs and all that shot but there is something about less is more I would say in a certain way and again we're not as big like country-wise population-wise we're not as big as the UK we're not as big as many other nations and and we also have no uh, speaking about Denmark here in particular, we have no strong industries. Like it's not like all the effects that we see with Ukraine being uh, at war right now, with great industries uh, shutting down and you know supplies are missing from you know warehouses mm-hmm. and stuff like that. That wouldn't happen if Denmark got you know uh, conquered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but so so there's something about you know Denmark being a academic sort of society in a sense that a lot of our value to the surrounding world is is through knowledge and i think i think the fact that i think it's about 85 percent of every dane that starts a higher education of some sort be it university or something else also completes it i think that adds to the to the happiness index so to say because people get a uh, you know wider perspective broader horizon and all that so they see things in a bit of a different perspective than people who maybe do not come from a academic background or has been used to you know hard physical labor throughout uh, most of their life and let's be honest some people who come from a background where there hasn't been a lot of school there hasn't been a lot of uh, sharing of knowledge and there's a great physical labor added to that as well they usually you know come from some sort of lower classes and do not necessarily enjoy a good life. And by that, I mean, they physically, they break down more, like mentally, they, they seem to struggle and financially, they just don't have the same, you know, resources as many else when it comes to insurance, uh, you know, health wise and stuff like that. So I think that adds up. So I think um, for me, one of the things that I'm trying to get my head around after spending uh, a good few weeks now, over the last year in Copenhagen and in, and across Denmark, is um, is the honesty value here. I think that might be one of the massive contributions to it being a happy society. Is that everyone values honesty here so much and the way it's being run that it's 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 not something that's it's non negotiable. And the way you're coming from London, where if you left your bike outside the shop for within five minutes, it might be stolen or. Anything for that matter, it's, it's very likely to be stolen. It's, um, 
it's, it's a different kind of mindset and, and mentality. And I, I don't know if that stems down right the way through, like politics being right through where the system is run. But yeah, what's your views on honesty and how maybe that impacts the happiness of, of Denmark? Well, I think as a Dane, you don't think too much about it, not actively, but I remember one of my one of my friends. He had a a friend come over, and uh, that friend brought an American girlfriend at the time, and she almost flipped at a poor Danish woman because she left her stroller outside the baker's, you know, just going in for a loaf of bread or whatever. And in Denmark, you know, the mentality is if I can see my dog, if if I can see my stroller, you know, through a window, there's no more than two meters, you know, between us, then it's okay. Um, she wasn't used to that like that. That was that was a sign of horrible parenting in, in, in her world coming from where she came from. But in Denmark, you know, of course you can leave your dog or uh, bicycle or stroller unattended outside the bakers or Neto, you know, our version of Tesco or whatever. Yeah. So, so like we don't think about it. We think it's common sense that what is ours, you know, people respect that mm. um, to a certain degree because there is like an unwritten an unwritten rule in Denmark. If you have a bicycle, it's parked outside, and you have a bicycle basket, people will use it as a trash can. Oh yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it's so annoying. But you you will come out and you're like, what the f-? you know, banana peels and whatnot. It's all in there. So, so that is a bit annoying. <laughs> the, um, I do remember cycling from uh, when my parents are in Ireland on my dad's side. I remember cycling with my cousins into the local town. Yeah. And we left the bikes there. Me and my sister were like, what are you doing? We can't leave the bikes here. He's like, no, they'll be fine. So we went off into town for a couple of hours and we came back and the bikes were there. And I was absolutely shocked. But then uh, supposedly now, people have only just started looking at their bikes now. Maybe the population's grown or maybe times are harder. Um, so this was going back a few years ago. But there's something that I found really interesting about the Danish people, and I've heard them mention this a lot, is about the, uh, correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, the Yindelo. Ah. Yendelo. Yendelo, yes. Can you tell me a bit about um, Yendelo? The law of Yente, I think that's <laughs> translated to. Um, I think, if, like, everyone everyone knows about Yendelo, uh, but not a lot of people knows where it kind of originates from. And if I remember correctly, it was this, like, half Danish, half Norwegian bloke. I'm not sure if he traveled to Denmark or he traveled from Denmark to Norway, but you know, he, he was in, in the Nordics and he wrote a book as far as I'm aware about a small Danish Danish made up village by the name of Yende. And basically there was a lot of allegories to how people lived and treated each other in this village, in this like little, uh, you know, enclosed society that you can take and, and use as a metaphor for, you know, greater, um, group of people, town, society, country and whatnot. But I think like there are 10 commandments or 10 tenets, and I can't remember them all, but a lot of it goes goes in the direction of that you shouldn't think that you're better than us. Like the individual shouldn't think that they're better than the group. The individual shouldn't think that they can teach the group anything. The individual shouldn't laugh or ridicule the group uh, and so on and so forth. So when people talk about Yendelo, they're not necessarily being specific to the ten tenants, but it's that whole feeling of being, you shouldn't believe you're better than anyone. And there, there is a certain, you know, there is a certain um, uh, feeling of the in a lot of things that uh, Nordic people uh, do, where it's not necessarily off-putting or, you know, with evil intent. Uh, have you seen some of the Carlsberg uh, commercial with Mads Mikkelsen riding on a bike? I um, don't think so, no. Oh, you haven't? Oh, <laughs> to anyone watching, Google that afterwards. Yeah. But basically, the, the way you feel Yandelo in that commercial is he claims to th- that Carlsberg is the best beer in the world, probably. Because I, I have seen, yes, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with the, yeah. with the phrase. Because you can't think that you you're know, better than everyone else. Okay, so, right. so the little probably, yeah. that's kind of the feel of the Yendelo going in there. You can't say it, but how close can we get to it? So, you know? so I, when I've heard this Yendelo, I'm not sure if I agree with it. I'm not sure if I like it. I feel like it in some ways holds people back. It like stops them from fully expressing themselves or maybe even creating something new or being a leader in their outright. So when I've heard this Yendelo, I kind of seen it a bit just like in the Danish society, but I wasn't sure if I if I am a fan of it. What's your view? Are you a fan of 
Jendelo. Yes and no. And a lot of my Danish friends, they might look at me weird when I say yes, <laughs> because because a lot of people see it in a very uh, negative light, which I think is natural. It's a natural way to look at it. I don't think that it's the right thing to go around teaching people you shouldn't believe that you're better than us. Uh, so in many ways, Jendelo is kind of like the anti-thesis of uh, America. You know, mm. be all that you can be, yeah. dream as big as you can dream and all that. But I think the there American is dream. <laughs> the American dream, yeah, the American freedom <laughs> eagle and all that. But I think there is a there is a courtesy element to it that in the Nordic countries and I, I don't know about especially Denmark, but for certain also Denmark, going around talking about all that you are is not necessarily considered polite or courteous. It's not that going back to to the honesty thing. It's not that we can talk about it. You shouldn't, but it shouldn't be the start of the conversation. It shouldn't be, hey, Karen, you know how much money I make. Hey, Karen, yeah. you know how cool of a guy I am. Yeah. It's more like, hey, tell me about you. And if and if we broach the subject, let's be honest. Let's talk about it. But you know, it ain't it ain't with your hands held high above your head, going, you know, I'm the greatest. Yeah, you know, it's it's more understating that. Like, if you ask me, do you think I'm the greatest? I think I'm doing well. You know, that would be that kind of subtle um, uh, courtesy clause in the Yandelo that I actually support. I think it's nice because I think you can upset and really rub some people the wrong way by going about like that. And that's just not me. Whether that's Danish or me, I don't know. But in that sense, I like Yandelo. But I don't like it in the way that, you know, you shouldn't believe that you can't amount to anything. You shouldn't believe that you yeah. can't teach somebody else. But start by saying hi and then figure out whether yeah. or not you can teach them something. I think I think I'm a bit of a fan of the American dream. Mm-hmm. I, I I like the um, optimism and like opportunity and the fact that you can go out and get what's yours. And <laughs> but I did also I did also live in uh, in America for a year where I was in Boston at college for eight months and then um, was laboring in New York for three months. And what I what I found was crazy when I was in uh, Boston was that. On the walls inside um, people's rooms, they would have their friends posted up on the wall supporting them. And I thought, you know what, that's so lovely. But in England, that would never happen. It was so weird with the English kind of society where I really like that because I think it's really important and good to build up your friends. Mm-hmm. And then, like, obviously, you know, again, human little yank. But, um, but, but in England, it's the exact opposite. People, um, you would be slaughtered for having your friend in the wall. You'd get the pissed ripped out of you you would um you, it wouldn't be allowed it would, like if you didn't put it down somebody else is going to put it down for you having a friend up there which i which i can see this is just part of like almost like the british humor and one thing i would say that the british humor i think is really really funny because it has no limits or boundaries it, it can and be it, very rough as well it, it's rough it's irrespective of people's feelings yeah. and that, that kind of makes it limitless and there's pros and cons to that. It means it can be really funny, often at the expense of other people. But, um, but yeah, I just went off on a bit of a tangent then. Uh, but, but I like what you're saying, both the, about British humour, because I'm a, I'm a great fan of like British, British uh, comedians, stand-up comedians. I think some of like the first comedians I listened to was uh, like the old bloke Lee Evans. Unfortunately, he doesn't do anything more. Also, a Scottish comedian, Billy Kong, and stuff like that. And <laughs> there is great observational comedy in a lot of English humor. Also, going back to Faulty Towers, Blackhead, and all that. But it, it is ruthless. There is no filter. <laughs> like, whatever is wrong with you, whatever you've done wrong, they will know. They will say it to your face. Yeah. And therein lies the comedy. And I think that is actually one of the great similarities between at least Denmark and, and the UK is that we have the same kind of sarcastic and, and oftentimes also uh, you know ironic twang to our humor where it, it goes a little bit dark and we like it that yeah. way. yeah but i think i think going back to the american uh, friend on the wall uh, thing there mm. i think we're at a great like divide in denmark i think you can definitely find groups where they would have the same reaction as you described mm. uh, from from your friends, but I think more and more in Denmark, it's 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 you know, especially for men being in touch with you know some emotions. I'm not saying their emotions, but just a bit of the spectre is becoming more and more valid. And I think going back to to the honesty that you also mentioned, this is this might be where it, it stems from that 
we can talk about uh, some things and we can also say you know this is this is okay it's valid to have this opinion it's valid to to feel like that. it's valid to you know support your friend because you are mates mm -hmm. but i still think there are some and it's not because it's tied to a specific uh, city, town, or demographic, but there, you still encounter some people who will look at you a little bit funny because they're not ready to for that level of openness yet. Yeah, but uh, but I think it's, it's starting to show more and more. So, so maybe that's the fact that that because um, I think Americans are very open and open-minded to the history yeah. of the country of people going over there is creating this massive open society. So maybe that's why they're able to do it in that, like a loving, friendly way. Um, something that I've felt was bizarre when I heard this over here in Denmark is that when you guys, if you're to call in sick, yeah. your employer, um, they're, they're not allowed to question it. Is it. Am I right in saying that? Uh, basically, yeah. So I can talk from, from the company where I work. If, if I was to call in sick, I would be sick and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the need to call in the day after. But on the third day, I think, third or fourth day, I would need to call in and say, I'm still sick. So, so basically, we can end up in a situation where, you know, I call in on a Monday and on Thursday, I'm like, what up, boss man? I'm still ill. You know, see you next week. Yeah. But I think, if I remember correctly, the em employer has the right to, to say, all right, you've been sick for plus three or plus four days. I need to see... Uh, something from your uh, GP, like your doctor, yeah. and I think that's because he needs it for HR, basically. Yeah. But then on the Monday, so you know, you've done whatever you've done on the weekend, <laughs> as that's your own business, your own personal life. The Monday you ring up, um, you say whatever reason you're ill, they're not allowed to question it. No. They can't. Qu they can't even question it. I don't think so. All right. So like in England. If, uh, if you ring up your employer on Monday in some professions, they're like, you what? What do you mean you're not fucking coming in? <laughs> <laughs> you taking the piss? <laughs> You've been out all weekend, haven't you? And then that's gonna, that could be the end of a job. So when I heard, or I think most people usually in other kind of professions, they'll probably say, oh, well, what's the matter? What's wrong with you? But then if, for instance, you had maybe had a heavy weekend and you just said, oh, you needed this rest or... Whatever the the reason was, you, you, that kind of added pressure of sometimes as humans we need a break. Sometimes we, we need might need that day off for so many reasons. You might not even want to be able to talk about it to your HR. So, but you also got to remember, like Denmark is the country of unions. We have unions for everything work related. Mm. So it's not only that a um, employee employer can ask about you know illness if they're calling in sick. It's also, you have, uh, I think it's five days, depending on your union and what uh, deal they have negotiated. But you usually have five days where you can call in and say, I'm neither sick uh, nor unable to work, but I'm not working today. Amazing. And, is and that across all jobs or that depends on the union? That depends on the union and, and the contract. And no, in, in my company, the company policy is just like uh, sickness or illness. Mm. You can't question it. But you only have five days, you know, to to you know spread over the year. Uh, you can still use a sixth day, but as soon as you've used the first five, yeah, a, a leader will be able to question it, and leader will also be able okay. to say that's void. You know, no, it's not. Okay. It's not going on today. You bring your ass into work. Today. <laughs> yeah. Or or yeah. say you know okay if you if something is happening you need to deal with it you get two hours but I expect you to be at the office in two hours so okay. that that can still be allowed. Wow. Amazing but I love the fact that you have those days like they, they thought about okay the people pe people need this sometimes for as you say no other reason then I'm not leaving the couch today kind of kind of mode and that kind of I think ties in with the kind of work life balance that goes on here in Copenhagen. Well, I think, and I think that's general uh, Denmark in general because with the new laws for for holiday, you know, each person in Denmark who has a job earns two point zero eight days vacation, paid vacation per month. Um, so most people have what twenty five days of vacation each year in Denmark. But then, depending on your union, depending on what deal your union has made with the, with the, the company or your employer you might be entitled to those five extra days or you might be entitled to, you know, call in sick and still get the full pay or whatever. 
And I think it's because there is a like a a school of thought in Denmark that says, well, if you're comfortable in your job, it's fair enough that you get ill. But if you're comfortable in your job, you would also have a natural urge to get back to your job because you're thriving in it. I know in <clears throat> in, in business circles, uh, especially in Denmark these days, there's a lot of talk about psycho psycho. I can't pronounce this word. Psychological <laughs> safety. There it is. Third time's the charm. Psychological <laughs> safety is basically also the tenant that we cannot have employees who are afraid to go to their boss or to their team lead, whatever, and call in sick or say they're not thriving. They they must have that safety to be able to thrive. And we as a company should be uh, able to help them. That is not to say that you know my team leader is all of a sudden going to turn into my therapist and start helping mm. me deal with my issues, but he should recognize the fact that I need some help, some time to get that help, and then hopefully because I've gotten that help, I can get back to work. Because let, let's be honest here, money-wise, it's more expensive to have a employee that is sick and then goes through some sort of HR uh, you know, session that leads to to the person getting sacked, and then the company has to recruit a new person, train that person up, and so on and so forth. Instead of just saying, "All right, we give you a day off to go talk to someone. You come back, tell us what the game plan is. We'll see if we can make it work. And then maybe in two months' time, you are maybe not happy, but you're happier again, and you are performing and functioning well within the company. And it's much more beneficial. So." Of course, it's the money machine talking as well, but it's also like if we if we make sure that we treat our you know people well, they'll they'll stay and we get something good out of it. And yeah. in the long run, that costs us less money than just sacking them the first you know. Or people time getting signing like, off stress yeah, yeah. and people then maybe becoming mentally ill because they're overworked, overloaded, and then if you're obviously stressed, you could have physiological problems on the body. You might end up getting sick for a longer term. Um, am I right in saying that people here on a Friday, there's a cut-off time on a Friday or something, that people can't work past a certain time on a Friday? Well, it, yes and no. <laughs> um, the reason why I'm, I'm not you know, just saying yes is because there, there is, I think, a general consensus in Denmark, depending, of course, on what line of work you have. Like if you're working at McDonald's and you have the late shift, you have the late shift, even though it's a Friday. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. But course, yeah. like a lot of office jobs, especially is, is going by the tenant that Friday you will be off earlier because it's the weekend, you want to go home, you want to get ready for uh, maybe a nice dinner with friends, maybe family, or just because you've worked quite a lot of hours uh, mm. throughout the week. So you just need to relax. So a lot of office jobs say you get off early on Friday. Okay, well, what's your views on that? There's been a lot of talk and speculation about potential four-day week in society going mm. forward. Are people doing that over here in Denmark? Is that something that's being trialed? What's your views on that? I mean, I know for me, when I was working full-time as a teacher, I used to hate doing my laundry on the weekends. I used to <laughs> really annoy myself. I know it's my time now. It's my time to do things. And I'm spending ages doing my laundry. And I was like, if I had the extra day off, could do all the different chores and things I need to do to make my week go around nicely with that extra day off. And then I'd have the whole weekend and be like a game changer, a big shift. And yeah, what's your views on the, the four day work week? I love it as a concept because I've actually tried it. I used to work at a different company mm -hmm. where I worked uh, Monday to Thursday. Um, it was a bit longer days though. Uh, I worked, I think it was from like 11 until eight or half past eight in the evening. So mm -hmm. it was a bit of a long shift, at least in Danish standards. But the thought that I could do groceries, you know, in the morning, get everything sorted before going to work, the thought that I could do laundry was, you know, amazing. And, you know, sometimes that's also what happened. Uh, I might be a bit of a lazy bloke, but oftentimes I would sleep in late, I would watch a movie, I would get showered and eat, and then I would go to work. And then in the evening, I would still do my laundry. <laughs> <I would> <laughs> do my shopping so so that didn't work uh, as well for me personally those four days but the friday was amazing because you realize when nobody else has the same rhythm as you and you don't have work that fills out uh, i don't know five to ten hours of your day you do those things like this is where the uh, handyman comes and, and do all the stuff this is where you go to collect that a parcel that will only get delivered, you know, on that weird time in the yeah. middle of the day and all that. So the Fridays were amazing because you you really had the sense of completion. You have done everything you need to do. Now you're actually just ready to go out and have a pint. 
or whatever you want to do. Yeah. So I like it. It's not something that, you know, in, in my opinion, it's not something that I see uh, companies just doing because they want to try but I see mm. especially like small companies that maybe have, let's say below uh, 50 employees, they want to try it out. I see it, especially in industries where it's a lot about, I don't see it in like the, the bank sector and like insurance sector and stuff like that, but I see it like in small startup companies where they're like, it's more important that we get quality out of the week's work than it is signing quality. signing off in our Excel sheet that we have been there for 39 hours a week or whatever. Yeah, so, so, so I know um, the basis of trialing it is because they think that people can be as productive in four days as they can in five. So I know some people on a Friday, they'll be doing everything but maybe their job, they might have different distractions or could even be tired by that point. And I think if you had that extra day, for, for that weekend, you come back in a bit more fresh, ready to go again, yeah, and sure. maybe a bit more fulfilled, and then maybe uh, you won't feel like you're always at work, so you'd have such a break. I know if you go away for a weekend, it can feel like you've been away for a long time. You had to change the scenery before going back into your mundane job. Um, one thing I wanted to mention before we wrap up this podcast is that the education system here in Denmark, mm -hmm. um, in England, it used to be three grand to go to university. That was kind of standard rate. And then they upped it to nine grand, which which was not really ideal. A lot of people were not unhappy with its students because the courses didn't really change much, but somehow it was all of a sudden six grand more. But it is set up in a good way that you only pay, you get can get student loans from the government and grants, and you only pay if you've got a job earning over approximately 20K. Okay. And so that's a small uh, percentage. So in that terms, compared to like America, where I know college fees are very expensive for some of the colleges, uh, I need to dive into vast um, op opportunities and decisions they have. Because I know people save up their college fund the whole time in like America. What is it here in Denmark? What is it? What is it? Um, it's free. <laughs> it's free. Well, basically, because um, like a lot of the things that people, you know, that hears about Denmark on the World Wide Web, they often say, yeah, yeah, but they have high taxes. Well, high taxes also mean that, you know, I can go to the doctor for free. I can get my surgery for free. I can get most of my treatments and whatever for free. It also means I can go to school for free. Wow. And of course, there is private schools that you pay for. Mm. Uh, there are boarding schools that you pay for and all that. But my own experience about going to university was I, I looked at what, um, you know, what course uh, interested me. And for some reason, it was English literature. And I applied. I got in. And that's it. Basically, that's all I had to do as a student. I had to apply by the deadline. And uh, if I had the grades, like the average to, to make it into that particular faculty, I, I would get it. And what then happens is that depending on whether or not you live at home by your parents, or if you live, you know, if you've moved out, then you can get the SU, which is basically the government's educational uh, support grant, uh, roughly translated. And it's about 5,000 kroners, probably a bit more now. It was mm. around 5,000 kroners when I was at the university 10 years ago. And you get that monthly if you're living uh, away from parents. If you live at your parents' house, then you get a bit less, maybe three and a half thousand, something like that. And that's free. That's just what that's you get. That's a grant. So you don't have to pay that back. You don't have to pay that back. Uh, but you have, you have uh, it's, it's kind of like a tour pass in a, in a sense. You get a certain amount of, of rights in, uh, in on this grant so uh, you can study for as long as you like basically if, if you have the grades and and you're doing well and complete your courses and stuff mm -hmm. like that but at some point you, you just there's no more you know power in this tour pass then it's yeah. done and then you have to finance uh, your rent or your food or whatever a different mm -hmm. way yeah I love that you can be a lifelong student, go back and do a master's or something at any time. I think that's so great for a forward-thinking society where they you value education so much. People can people can upskill themselves. People can change careers more easily. And then, as a society as a whole, the more educated is going to lead to less discrimination, less violence, more um, give back, be able to give back more to to the society. I, I totally agree with it. I agree with that. 
And this is also how I perceive Denmark. And that is not, you know, to slag off any other countries. I just don't know them as well or their mm. systems uh, for supporting education. But I do believe that I need to uh, let somebody in. <laughs> All right. Let's... So whilst Orlando is letting someone in, I'll say some things that I really like about um, about the Danish society is is I love that you can actually see where the taxes have been spent. Um, me as a PE teacher and growing up playing football my whole life, all I ever wanted was a cage to play in in the suburbs of London. There, there was no cage I could play in. I was just I used to, I had two different plastic girls that I used to bring into the streets. The neighbors used to come. I used to play in the streets on this uh, on this close. Um, yeah, and we integrate that into our city planning. So we had so many playgrounds and whatnot. And, and this is this is what I love. I love that you can see the sports everywhere: table tennis, ping pong, uh, basketball, football, even the trampolines all around the streets of Copenhagen for people to play sports. And I love I love that fact. And I really wish that that was something that we had more in London. There is a few, but not much. But seeing as we're having guests in a minute, I just want to round off with my uh, my final point. It's that speaking about lifelong learning, I actually think it's a it's a tenant within the Danish government that they wish to create the foundation for people to be able to uh, educate themselves throughout their lives. So there's nothing in Denmark. I'm not saying there is in other countries, but there's nothing in Denmark that says as soon as you're done with university at the age of 20 something, you're done. It's all about if if it creates value for you and it creates value for your family or mm. your company or whatever, then do it. And that is basically what Denmark is funding through the government. So so obviously the taxes are very high, but I feel like in, in England a lot of time you think, oh, your education is done now, completely junior, mm. yay. But instead we should be trying to create lifelong learners, people who want to carry on educating themselves. It doesn't yeah. just stop there, it actually just starts then. It's actually when you start doing your own education. But as we've heard so many great things about the Danish society, what's just before we finish, what's some of the some of the niggles or some of the things that um, you think could be improved, or maybe some of the things that you don't like as much? Oh, there, there are loads, of course there are. I think <laughs> in the beginning you said something about one of the things you liked about Denmark is that like open honesty that, and also that if you went around and you just said hi in, in the UK, <laughs> they'd look at you mad. It's, in London, in, in the other outside of London, the UK is actually very friendly. In the suburban, suburban towns, even up north, they're friendly. Just in London, there's too many people for for the friendliness. But yes, but, it, but it's very funny that you say that because um, I view Danes as fairly open-minded and, and willing to say hi and, and meet new people. But I've heard from so many other people who come from abroad to Denmark that they view Danes as you know closed-off bastards that have no emotion <laughs> and stuff. So, so I think there's there's definitely a, some sort of like mismatch in how Danes perceive themselves uh, as to how other people from other country, uh, countries and cultures perceive us. So one of the things I think we could be better at is be more inclusive. And I think that also goes back to the word hygge, which some people may or may not have, have known. It's like a very Danish concept, concept of hygge. But the root of it is positive. But the root of it is also you do it with a group, a close, closely knit group of uh, people mm -hmm. whom you know. And I think that's very ingrained into our culture that we can be so friendly, we can be so open, but only with so people, people that, that we know okay. very well. And I think we, there's room for improvement there. Okay, this is a bit random now. I know we're trying to start off the podcast here, so the, the weekend can start. Do you think the Danish people are proud of the Vikings? Or do you think their relationship is with the, with the Vikings? Because I've seen it, some of the advertising, like the buses is called the, it was the Viking buses. And uh, and obviously it's very, the Vikings are famous. So what, what, is the, what is that relationship? I think that varies very much depending on on who uh, you're asking, of course, also where in the country you ask. I okay. think if you ask, oh, I think it's near Roskilde, it's, uh, it's um, on Shella and by the south of Copenhagen. I think they actually have a Viking ship museum there. Oh, yeah? So in that area, they might have a bit more, you know, uh, strong th thoughts and feelings about Vikings and being part of it. Maybe if you go to Jutland, because there are great traces uh, in Jutland and also through history of Vikings being in Jutland and going from Jutland to England to raid and pillage and do stuff uh, mm. to y'all. Um, but I think if you ask people in Copenhagen, most people wouldn't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, brother. It's been great catching up. It's always fun, my man.